What's going on, people? Welcome to another episode of the Off the Ball Podcast with me, your host, Chris LeBron, and we are brought to you by the Off the Ball Network. And I got a special co-host with me, the VP of the Off the Ball Network, my man, Mo Up in Flames, Murphy Mo. Thank you for, for coming on the show with me and doing this, man. What's going yeah. on, brother? Hey, I'm doing good, bro. I appreciate you for having me. Uh, definitely big opportunity, bro. Definitely glad to talk to NBA vet right here. So, you know, I know this is going to be some great conversations. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yes, yes, yes. And we have a special guest with us today. We got a former NBA veteran, Arkansas basketball legend, Ronnie Brewer. What is going on, Ronnie? Not much, man. How are y'all guys doing? We go, are man. good. We are good. How, how was your day? How's everything going? How you handle all the craziness with COVID and all this? Well, I mean, it's pretty good. Uh, my day's going pretty good. Um, you know, actually, you know, I live in Arkansas right now, and, you know, we, we've handled the COVID situation pretty good. I mean, we haven't really shut down and stopped at all. <laughs> uh, we actually have um, a game that, uh, <laughs> we, we We play our conference tournament. So, so far, um, we played – 25 games this year so we've been able to get it in uh we're 20 and 5 and we have the opportunity to, to play tonight to punch our ticket into the conference championship yeah yeah i know living in new york city it's the complete opposite <laughs> you know everything shut down you know you can't even you know you can't even get a sandwich without you know restrictions and all that so you know uh but um what, what are you doing now? What, what's Ronnie Brewer doing now? Uh, what, what's yeah. what's uh, what's going on on your daily basis? Yeah, uh, well, I, I'm a coach um, and teacher at Fayetteville High School. Uh, you know, I'm the head sophomore basketball coach, I, assistant coach for JV and varsity. Um, I teach oral communication, and uh, my spare time, I, I teach uh, youth or I coach a youth basketball league uh, team uh, on the EYBL circuit, the Arkansas Woods Elite. Um, and so looking forward to be able to do that. And, you know, the, the country opened up a little bit to allow these kids to have an opportunity to, to earn a college scholarship. And, you know, outside of that, I, I have the Ronnie Brewer Foundation that we, we, we do a lot of things here locally in Northwest Arkansas. And uh, that keeps me pretty busy. And, you know, I've got a couple of business endeavors uh, around Arkansas um, that, that keep me uh, predominantly busy most of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's awesome to hear. And obviously, you know, with all the you know with COVID and all that, and just the restrictions with with uh, you know having a lot of people indoors and and facilities being closed. You know, how yeah. how were you able to handle that with your with your, your team and all that with all those restrictions? And you know, I know in New York City for me, when everything first happened, um, a big thing in New York City was they closed everything, like gym and that, and even outside where they were taking down hoops. So yeah. there was unless you already had. A hoop in the backyard or something there was nowhere to to get you know to get a run so yeah. how were you able to to help you know do that with your with your guys well i mean um when it initially started we were in the same boat um in arkansas you know all the gyms were closed um our schools were closed including all the facilities uh all, all the parks were closed they took the hoops off the off the goals um and you know basically everybody was forced to stay inside um, as time went on, you know, some of the restrictions uh, lightened up. Um, but, you know, it wasn't easy at all. You know, we, we, we got to, um, like, you know, come up with all these uh, precautionary uh, um, standards that we have to, had to go through to, to ensure that everybody was being safe and healthy. Um, each and every person, student, athlete, and teacher, um, to get this back going. And so, you know, it took a lot of time and planning, um, you know, a lot of you know, careful preparation. You know, we started out with, you know, Zoom, Zoom meetings where we were just, you know, keeping in contact with each other. Then it went to Zoom activities where it was kind of like a PE class, guys working on ball handling, push-ups, sit-ups, bodyweight squats, lunges, um, and just, you know, keeping guys, um, you know, uh, locked in and focused you know everybody was not in a good place as far as you know knowing what the future was going to be so we were just trying to be optimistic and, and keep these guys positive and you know we slowly but surely got back where we were able to practice uh, we started off where we couldn't we were social distancing and so it was basically individual workouts um and you know we could only have like eight guys in the gym one guy at each basket um and we were there 
pr pretty much all day to be able to get everybody um, in um, and have them, you know, social distance and be safe and, and take the temperatures and you know, have the hand sanitizer and all those different things like that. And, yeah. you know, just to, to fast forward to where we are now, we've, we've come leaps and bounds to places. And now we were able to, you know, have fans in, in the gym, um, you know, obviously social distancing and then, you know, actually playing games on the, and playing 25 games and having a full season where we didn't miss a game. And, you know, it's, it's just a blessing um, in disguise. Yeah, yeah. Mo, you got something for him? Yeah, so my thing is, when did you decide that coaching was what you wanted to do um, after your NBA career? Because yeah. one, not a lot of NBA players can do that or have yeah. the knowledge to do that. But two, like, it's it's a guy like you, an Arkansas legend, Mr. Arkansas, you know, coming out of there. What made you want to go back and be a coach and, and give the same opportunity that you had or an opportunity that you yeah. didn't have to, to other kids, especially high school kids? What made you want to do that? Well, it, it started out with uh, my foundation, the Ronnie Grill Foundation. Um, you know, around here, um, being an Arkansas Razorback is is you're basically a movie star, especially if you if you have some clout where you're successful uh, mm -hmm. of being a Razorback. Um, and so, my dad played at Arkansas, went to the NBA. He would come back in the summer and put on a basketball camp, and you know that was my early, my earliest. Uh, memories of of how I started playing basketball. So, you know, I, t I, I told my mom that, you know, if I could ever make it to the NBA, you know, I, I, I would come back to Arkansas and, and give a basketball camp. So 2006 was my first basketball camp. Um, you know, I, I felt like I had a knack for it because I've been around basketball my whole life, played in the NBA, watched my dad run camps. Um, and the influence I had on the youth was, you know, phenomenal. You know, you know, we, we were having camps where we were having 200 to 300 people. We ended up splitting the camps up in, in two different sessions because uh, of the capacity. And, you know, right there, I knew I had a calling and, you know, it was something that I was passionate about. You know, you fast forward now, um, you know, this is I finished my second year um, on staff and, and teaching that, you know, I, it came, you know, it was a, a love for the game, you know, be able to to give back to, to these student athletes, like people before me um, gave to me, you know, he's kind of, he's kind of repaying, um, you know, to the game that, that gave so much to me. So, you know, this is my third year as um, uh, an EYBL basketball coach, and that kind of triggered my, my, you know, as well as, you know, my, my one of my best friends, uh, Coach Stamps, got the head coaching job at Fayetteville, reached out to me, hired my mentor, Nick Bradford, uh, you know, former Kansas Jayhawk grad. And it was a no brainer to become on the staff and, and coach at my, you know, my alma mater and, you know, being able to influence these kids and just basically tell them some of the stuff that, that I've been through and how I can help them out and, and be able to see it trans, uh, transition and translate to positive things on and off the court has, has been a great journey so far. Yeah. So let, let's go back. Let, let's go back in time a little bit. Obviously, you said, you, you know, you're a legend in Arkansas. So talk to us about yeah. growing up in Arkansas and, and the basketball scene there, because, you know, you know, we don't hear really hear much. You know, I'm from New York. You hear about New York City, hear about California, Florida, Texas. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about the Arkansas basketball yeah. scene growing up. Man, it's a, it's, a, it's a hidden gem. It's like a diamond in a rough. I tell people that all the time. And you know, people were like, well, you know, Arkansas, what's in Arkansas? Y'all don't, don't wear shoes in, uh, in Arkansas. Y'all wear overalls. It's like that. But <laughs> it's nothing like that. I mean, we've got some big time hoopers that, that come out of the state of Arkansas. A lot of guys that make it to the league. Um, you know, right now we have, you know, Bobby Portis and Daniel Gafford and, you know, Pat Beverly's from Chicago. But, you know, he played at Arkansas and, you know, uh, Mason Jones is from Texas, but he went to Arkansas. Yeah. So, you know, we got a lot of guys that, that, that you know, play – uh, played in Lee, Joe Johnson, Scotty Pippen, Derek Fisher, Cordis Williamson, Oliver Miller, Todd Day, Lee Mayberry, my dad, Sidney Moncrief. Uh, I mean, you can go on and on and on. Dante Jefferson played. Um, so, you know, our high school scene is, is is crazy because it's so much talent. It's a hotbed. You know, even, you know, as lo even as young as like, you know, fifth and sixth graders um, playing elite youth basketball at a high level. So, um, you know, growing up here, like I said before, you know, the biggest thing here is the University of Arkansas and being a Razorback. We have no professional team. Um, 
you know, the closest team to us is Oklahoma City Thunder, and that is fairly new. Um, Dallas Mavericks and the Memphis Grizzlies. And outside of those teams, there's there's no professional team. So the Razorbacks are the professional team. So I looked up to, to the Razorbacks, all their players, and, you know, I used to say if I was good enough one day that, you know, hopefully I could go there. But, you know, it worked out. I ended up going to Arkansas and, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. Mo? Yeah, so with going to Arkansas, um, all those basketball players, you know, all the names have held weight or hold weight in the basketball world now. But how is it being at Arkansas, being playing in the SEC, which is a predominantly, you know, well-known uh, mm -hmm. football powerhouse. So how tough is it to be a basketball player in the SEC conference and kind of make a name for yourself and, and make your program and the basketball program overtake what football means in the Southeast of conference and in the Southern states in general? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think I don't think um, the SEC will ever be looked at as a basketball conference just because the dominance that they've had in football. I mean, Alabama's won so many national championships. Uh, Florida's won so many national championships. LSU's won so many national championships. So uh, Tennessee, um, I mean, you can go on and on and on with the success that they've had on the football side. But that, that doesn't take away that the success that they've had um, Basketball-wise, you know, Arkansas has won a national championship. Kentucky's won a national championship. Florida's won the national championship. We had LSU go to a Final Four. Um, I mean, Kentucky's always, always, always going to be good. Unfortunately, they're not good this year. But you know, um, every year, year in year out, they've got one and duns and guys that are, that are vowing for a national championship. Or, you know, make far runs. So, you know, for me, um, you know, when I was going going to college, entering college, Arkansas was kind of down. And, and my goal was just to get them back to relevancy and prominence and get guys wanting to go to Arkansas and, and it being cool again um, for staying at home and, and, and representing your home state. Yeah, that, that's definitely big time because I know it's a battle playing for Arkansas. And I know, you know, the fall is everything. Um, I'm from Florida, so I understand, you know, playing basketball, it's like you get told – to play football. Like football is kind of your meal ticket out in those yeah. southern states, especially Florida. Yeah. So it's like basketball kind of gets pushed to the side. We got some ballers that have came out of there, but you know, it kind of gets pushed to the side for the simple fact like football is the meal ticket. That's where majority of the players are. Yeah. The rosters are bigger. So I, I fully understand about being a guy who plays basketball in a predominantly football state or whose college is in a, you know, a football conference. So I, I definitely understand that, but but that's definitely huge. Was it was it always Ronnie? Was it always Arkansas? Were you always going to go to Arkansas, or were you? Was there any other considerations for any other school? Man, it's funny you said that because you know everybody was like, "Oh man, there's no brain. He's going to go to Arkansas. His dad went to Arkansas. His mom went to Arkansas. His sister ran track at Arkansas. He's going to Arkansas." But to be honest, like I really was considering other other places, like. You know, I went on a official visit to UConn, and I don't know. I mean, you're from Florida, you know. In Arkansas, you know, you, you saw in the in the in on the Weather Channel the last, you know, a week and a half ago, two weeks. You know, Arkansas and Texas was hit hard, and if you're from New York or Chicago or Northern states, like, you know, you see ice and snow every day. You know, we used down to that. The <laughs> and, we're used to and you got equipment to clear the roads and stuff like that, and. You know, here is not not so much. So I went on my UConn visit. UConn was very high on my list. You know, they were telling me about, you know, they were getting Rudy Gay and they had Ben Gordon and Emeka Okafor. And, you know, it, it was a blizzard there. And I was like, oh, man, we're going to have to cancel my visit. And everybody looked like, well, what's, what's going on? You don't feel good? And I was like, no, there's snow outside. You know, we'll have to reschedule you know, for another weekend. And... That kind of was like, what are you talking about? Well, what I'm used to is, you know, it's, it snows. We're out of school for a week. Everything's shut down. The restaurants are closed. Grocery stores sold out of everything because it's like the end of the world. And and up there, it was just another day. And I was like, oh, y'all got to go to class still. Y'all still got practice. <laughs> yep. People are moving around in the snow. It's like mm -hmm. 10 degrees. I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to cut it here. And, you know, I was considering Kansas because I was a huge Roy Williams fan. I was considering Oklahoma State because uh, Eddie Sutton coached my dad um, in college when they went to the Final Four. Um, 
Oklahoma with Kelvin Sampson, phenomenal coach. Uh, Florida with Billy Donovan. Uh, and that's kind of what it came down to, those schools right there. And at the end of the day, you know, Arkansas recruited me harder than every one of those schools. Every every game I played in high school, they were there. Every AU game I played, they were there. So they showed me the most love and, you know, made me feel important and, and basically said that, you know, made me feel like I could be a, a, the uh, game changer to, to get us back on the right path. And, and that's what kind of what sold me. Nice. How was the transition? And this is something I talk to a lot of guys about. What's the transition from being going to high school and then go, be going to going to a big time university and just uh-huh. that's a culture shock. Like I, I know yeah. for just a regular student, it's a culture shock, let alone yeah. a student athlete. Just talk to me about that first year on campus and the well, adjustments well, you had all, to make. Yeah. First of all, like high school is basically like they, they everybody does everything for you. Like they, 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 all your classes are right next to each other. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not walking, you have to go anywhere. You have a set schedule. You don't take buses to a one campus. To another. Yeah. And so the first thing is knowing that like, no matter what the weather, rain, sleet or snow, they, they still have classes. Your classes <laughs> might not be in the same, it might be on across campus. Um, and your academic advisor and your coach expects you to make every class be on time and do well. So that is something that, you know, is a shock because, you know, you were so accustomed to your classes being right there. Um, you know, the, the training table, having like your, 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 your health and wellness, uh, you know, for me, it was putting on weight, you know, I was having it was on a diet to gain weight, get stronger. Strength and conditioning program was, 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 was huge for me. Um, and then just the um, speed of the game. You know, everybody's somebody in college. You know, you were all state, all conference somewhere, or JUCO All American, and everybody could play. And so the physicalness, the athleticism, the the pace of the game uh, sped up from high school to college. And um, you know, you just had to adapt and and and, and find your niche and, and figure out a way to make it work. Yeah, Mo. Yeah, you like. I'm glad you brought that up because like that was gonna be like a question I was gonna ask. Was the adjustment? Because all y'all go D1, and then y'all everybody, like you said, they're the man in high school. But was it a humbling experience for you to be a freshman at Arkansas, knowing that well, even if you were a humble athlete in high school, you were that guy. Everybody knew who Ronnie Brewer was in the area in high school. You know, I'm sure when it came to a lot of things, parties, whatever, you know, whatever you decided to do, you were that guy. Everybody loved Ronnie Brewer. Everybody knew who he was. You walk in the room and it, wow, was it, were you humbled at all or kind of shocked a little bit when you get there and like everybody else was you in high school? Like we all were those guys. Was it humbling at all? Well, I had like a really crazy experience in, in, in college. You know, my freshman year, I, I get all these preseason accolades and, you know, you know, Fayetteville is a really tight-knit community. You know, if you go to college, you know, your college of choice is the University of Arkansas. So mm-hmm. it was like a high school reunion, first day on campus, you know, at, at Arkansas. So the season's about to start, you know, all my homegirls that, like, I grew up from kindergarten with, I go visit them at the all-girl dorm. And, you know, they've been the homies for, you know, for my whole entire life. They're, I mean, I'm, I'm – they're like my sisters. I'm I'm a brother to them. Yeah. And I get in the elevator and it's a basketball schedule and I'm on the I'm the on the poster. And I'm like, dang, that's kind of crazy. Didn't think anything of it. Go talk to all we're, we're in like the little lobby area. Uh it's about 20 of us out there just chilling. And people are coming up like, oh man, let me take a picture or get an autograph on this. And you know, my my friends are like, what is go like what are what is going on? What are they doing? And I was like, I don't know. They put out some poster and I, they put me on it for some reason. I don't know. And I got to go to the coach and be like, yeah, let's switch it up and put our whole team on it. It's a team game. I don't know why. The, like, I, I understand the preseason honor and, and is amazing. But, like, I don't need that attention. Like, we got a lot of work to do as a team. Um, we need to build team chemistry. We have a lot of freshmen. Um, and, you know, I think that shifted and made us go in the right direction because – um, you know, it, it was a grind. We knew that we weren't where we're, we're supposed to be. You know, you had LSU that had 
All Americans on their team. The Mississippi State had All Americans on their team. Florida All Americans. Um, Alabama was really good. Uh, Kentucky was really good. So you know, we were playing these guys. We're getting punched in the mouth, and you know, you got to go back to the drawing board and be like, "What am I doing wrong?" So you know, we we basically was like, "We got to outwork our opponent." We got in the weight room with our strict conditioning coach Kelly Lambert. Um, you know, hit the training table hard. Got up extra shots before and after practice. Um, watch film, and to me, it was like iron sharpened iron, and that was humbling because, like, you know, like you, you, everybody was the man in high school. Everybody was all conference, all state. But to see guys and see their work ethic to try to take that next level and that next jump is something special, and and it's something that I, you know I would never change uh, in, in in my life. Um, you know, if I could go back and do it over again. When did you start really feeling comfortable once you got to college? You know, and and as far as all right, class, you know, ball, all that. When did you start feeling all right? Now I'm comfortable, and now I, you know, I'm getting in the rhythm. What was that? Was it your, you know, towards the end of the freshman year or sophomore year? When was that? Like, all right, I feel comfortable. I, I got my schedule. I know what to do. I'm good now. I mean, I was comfortable as far as like my schedules like that because I grew up here, and for us, like we had open open campus where we can go to uh, eat lunch. So, you know, we thought we was swagged out. We thought he was cool, so we would eat lunch at the student union and act like we was in college already. So, like knowing what my classes were and fitting in was, you know, I, I got that on day one. But you know, it it took some, it, you know, it took some time to adapt my 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 freshman year because. You know, everybody was bigger and stronger than me. And, you know, I I, I took that as something I didn't do. Like, I, I was getting out work, and I took it personal. And it wasn't until that, that summer, you know, I went to Adidas All-American Camp. Uh, and I went to uh, Nike All-American Camp to work. And, you know, when I came back, playing against the best of the best college guys, my confidence was up. i have been in the weight room like crazy. Um, and when I got back that first and second semester of summer school, I knew like, hey, you know, this year's gonna be something special. And the remainder of the time that I'm here at Arkansas, I'm gonna be to do, be doing the punishing and not getting punished because my freshman year we were just too small. Everybody was outpowering us, pushing us in the paint to get rebounds, just being more physical than us because they were bigger and stronger. And and you know, after dealing with that for the first year, you know, I wasn't gonna take that my second and third year. Mo. Yeah. Well. So, so when did the, all that grinding in college and, and the Mr. Arkansas in high school, when did the NBA seem real to you? Because I'm sure being that guy, everybody knew you was going to the league or, or, or had that feeling like this is the guy, he's going to go to the league from here. But when to you did it seem real that like, not I'm going to the NBA. I know I'm built for the NBA and I, and I know I'm going. It was probably midway through my sophomore year. Like, you know, I was I was consistently getting, you know, 16, 17 points a game. Uh, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm able to get to my spots. You know, I'm able to facilitate for my teammates. You know, I'm getting, I'm not getting overpowered. Um, mm -hmm. I'm controlling the boards. Um, I'm making plays for others. I'm, I'm attacking the basket. I'm finishing. Um, and the game is starting to slow down and become easy to me, uh, you know, at the end of that year, you know, people were approaching me like, hey, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to the league? I was like, man, I really don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I had been in favor of my whole entire life. You know, I, 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 to me, in my in my eyes, I was still a kid. You know, I, I wasn't grown up yet. You know, I you know, couldn't even go to the bars. I couldn't really, like, I wasn't an, an adult. Uh, I wasn't really cooking for myself, doing my own laundry. Like, I was asking for help from my mom. Like, yo, teach me how to, teach me how to do this. And I was like, man, I, I can't imagine myself being anywhere outside of Fayetteville by myself. Um, that summer in my junior year, it was a time of growth. Like, okay, now I'm matured. Uh, now uh, I think my body's ready. I think my game's ready. Um, and I, I think it's, it's time to take my talents to the NBA. Yeah. And when – how was the process for you? All right, so you, you declare for the draft, you know, you, you're leaving Arkansas. Mm -hmm. How was that process? Because obviously, you know, you're going through the 
you know, I had to go through the combine and all that. But and then, but was there, you know, you're li- are you listening to where you're going, projecting? Did that, a, that was that a, a big part of, you know, you coming out? Did, were you yeah. were there people telling you oh, you're gonna go, you know, lottery? That you're gonna go top twenty? Was there like, did you hear like, all right, I'm gonna be a first round pick? So this is that was your decision. Was how was that process for you? The draw, whole draft process. Yeah. The rules are a little different now, but back then, like if you didn't sign with the agent, um, you had to pick up your own tab, basically. So my 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 decision making was, you know, we're gonna go to we're gonna go to o- Oklahoma City. We're gonna go to um, uh, well, actually, it was Oklahoma City wasn't there. Um, they were they, they yeah. weren't there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was. A, uh, we were going to go to Dallas. We we're going to go to Memphis. Uh, we we're going to try to drive up to Chicago. We we're going to try to drive. Like we we're going to. Our idea was we we're going to try to drive, like to Houston and all these places where I could where I could play. Then we make a call to the NBA and it was like, "Hey, where's my projections at?" You know, to try to get an idea if I'm going to keep my name in the draft or if I'm going to, you know, uh, you know, come back to, to college and. You know, they had said I had a good chance to go lottery. And at that time, that's when I was like, okay, you know, there's people out there that, that like my game. And all you need is just one team to 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 like you. And, you know, I put my name in the draft, signed with the agent, went to go work out for all these teams. And I thought it went fair, fairly well. Uh, each place I went, you know, it was just unfortunate. Some guys fell in the draft. Some guys got picked before other guys that, you know, kind of unexpected and kind of shifted the paradigm where I, I, I slid down to 14. But, you know, still excited to get drafted by the Utah Jazz and play for a phenomenal legendary coach uh, in Jerry Sloan. Rest in peace. Yes, rest in peace, Jerry Sloan, legend, legend. So well, did you hear from the Jazz? Was that – did you have a feeling that you were going to Utah? Or or how, how was that? Because you'll hear stories – about you know they you work out for ten teams and then yeah, yeah, you know yeah. there's that team that you didn't work out for and they draft you. How that's was that like? Because you know I'm I've heard crazy stories like that. <laughs> that's the exact thing that happened. <laughs> I, I didn't work out for Utah. I worked out for the top eleven teams, no top twelve teams in the draft, and that's it. I, I didn't I didn't work out for any other teams. Uh, I had spoken to the Jazz. And, um, and I visited them as an interview, but I didn't. It was like on my way back to Arkansas at the end of the at, at the end of the town, right right before the draft. I just had a, a conversation with Coach Sloan, uh, Kevin O'Connor, some of the scouts, and then I flew back to to Fayetteville. Um, you know, everybody's always like, "Oh man, Ronnie knew he was going to the Jazz." You know, look at the suit that he wore. Like, you know, he got <laughs> drafted, and all the pictures that he has is matching the Utah Jazz colors. And I was like, mm-hmm. "Now there's a story behind that." Like. All the players got sponsored, or basically got a sponsorship suit uh, from a company, and we down we went down there to take our preliminary pictures. Well, everybody looked like each other, like everybody looked the same because all the suits were made by the same company. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, you know, we're all individual people. You need to show like our like how we're 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 we've got the same goal and same dream, but we're all different individuals. So I went up there and I changed into my suit. Um, the draft is going on. I see guys' names going. And I'm like, oh man, like I thought he was gonna go higher. I thought he was gonna go lower or whatever. And we get to number 12 and they pick, and I was like, oh shoot. My mom was like, what? And I go, my dad I said, well, you know, I, I didn't work out for any other teams. <laughs> and so, you know, this might be a problem. <clears throat> uh and so I got nervous at those next two picks. I was like, I don't know where I'm going to go. I have no <laughs> idea. Um, luckily, Utah pulled the trigger and, 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 and called my name, and I was so excited to be able to walk on the stage and, uh, you know, put the hat on and give Dave Stern a, a big hug, rest in peace to him as well. But, um, you know, it was like a dream come true. You know, kid from Fayetteville on a big stage in New York City at the Garden, um, get your name called and – you know, the whole state being behind you and cheering you on and rooting for you. So it was an amazing, amazing feeling. Yeah, I've always said, like, I'm sure even if you know you're, like, the number one pick and you're Zion where you know you're going number one, but to actually hear your name being called 
I mean, it, it, I'm sure the emotions are just like, wow, like you yeah. dreamt for this, this whole, like your whole childhood, you're like, one day I'm going to be, you know, uh, I'm going to get on that stage and get, you know, and be able to, to shake you know, David Stern's hand and, and, and get drafted. Like, and I'm sure that was just, just incredible moment for you. Like, it just and, and, hearing and your the, name. And the bigger thing is, like, I don't think that like the fans get this, but like for the players, all we were talking about one was getting drafted, fitting in, and you know, you know, being in the NBA. But the bigger thing for us, who was in the green room, is like, like the setup is. I mean, you're down on the floor, um, but behind you, you've got thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of fans, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you didn't want to be that guy that was picked, and the fans were upset that you got picked to their team and booed you. And especially so, Knicks, uh, you're in Knicks territory. <laughs> yeah. and, so, and so for me, like you know, getting my name called by the jazz, having jazz fans there and having people actually like go crazy for you. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you literally can't like, like simulate what that feels like. You know, one is a dream come true, getting your name called and going up there on the stage, but to actually have like the fans cheering you on, in your mind, because in their minds, it was a great pick. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and you see it so many times in football, you see it in basketball that a guy's picked and fans are there and they're pissed and they boom and so like that. And <laughs> you know, you know, you you don't want to be I know. I'm a Knicks yeah, fan, but they boo yeah. everyone every year. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be that guy, you know what I'm saying? And so like to to get the acceptance and support from the fans um on um, draft night, it's 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 second to none, man. I'm trying to tell you it was, it was great. Yeah, Mo. Yeah, so not we don't have to say any names or anything, but something you pointed out was some guys went higher than you thought, some guys went lower than you thought. For you, uh, it seems like you really should have went higher. You were told you probably would go higher. You worked uh -huh. out for twelve teams, so I, I feel like you probably thought you weren't going any lower than twelve. Yeah. Did you go in with that chip on your shoulder because you looked at guys who like? And I'm sure all you guys do this is like yeah. when you see a certain guy go before you. You're like, I yeah. know I'm better than him. So I'm sure there's guys who will say that every year. Did that bring a chip on your shoulder coming into your rookie year, knowing well, that there might have been two to three guys better or that you were better than and you knew it that got drafted before you? Well, just just because of the 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 attention that these guys got, I think everybody going into the draft was like, man, I want to go at – Adam Morrison, I want to go at J.J. Redick, and I want to go at Sheldon Williams. You know, Duke was on TV you know, <laughs> two or three times a week, um, and Gonzaga was on TV, and, you know, every commercial was Adam Morrison, J.J. Redick, because they were having a phenomenal year. I know, and, and I wonder if you're going to say it. Oh, we got Ronnie back on the show. Sure, What's going on? Nah, no, that's all good. Yeah. So what were we what were we leaving off? Oh, we were leaving off. Oh, you were saying the name. See, and Mo got real hype, and then you let off. And he was like, "Oh man, Bo." Uh, I was I like, he "Oh, <laughs> he's getting to the different guy." Oh. No, so, so so the the guy that 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 everybody was like, man, he was untouchable, and he was a head and shoulders above everybody. Was Brandon Roy? Yeah, I mean, see, that was the name I was thinking. I was Brandon, name. Brandon Roy was so good in those individual workouts. Oh, was everybody was like, "Oh man, this guy's gonna be special." And I don't think everybody. I don't think. Like the GMs and and like I don't think they knew how good he was. Like all the players that you know played was like, oh, there's no way that Brandon Roy, uh, um, shouldn't have been like first or second pick. You know what I'm saying? The third. Yeah, he went sixth. And like yeah. looking back now, like obviously his career well, that you know got cut short for injuries. But you look at now, it's like. Yeah. How did he go six? He yeah. was a and he was nice in college at, at you at Washington. So it's like yeah, how he, did he go six? Yeah. So like you see it like being being in the green room, you, you see the first pick, you see the second pick, the third pick, the fourth pick. I'm like, this dude, drop, this dude is dropping. If he's dropping, yeah, where am I gonna go? Because like I, I saw what he was doing in the workouts, and I know what kind of player he is. So mm -hmm. that's when guys kind of got you could see like. You know, myself, Rudy Gay, Randy Foy was like, we were like, oh shoot, like yeah. if he's dropping, like what, what's gonna happen with us? You know what I'm saying? So um but phenomenal player, you know, great career, unfortunately, you know, cut short by injury, but you know, yeah. that guy was very special going through the whole draft process and being yeah. a part of, you know, being able to play against him. And wasn't that the first year where they eliminated guys going from high school? 
Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. No, was- because because yeah, that was the first year that they couldn't go from high school. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that because that's when they changed the rule. We had to do one and done and all that. And how, how did you take on, on one and done before we get on to the next topic? You know, um, did you like that rule when they implemented it? You know, Not really because I feel like you're putting a cap on somebody's earning ca- capabilities. Like yeah. you don't see that in golf. You don't see it you in, don't see that in any other sport. In yeah. baseball, um, football because of I, I think the, you know, coming out of high school, you're just not – your body's not big enough and you're not physical enough to mm-hmm. go yeah, with of course, yeah. that no makes sense. In the that makes sense because it's such a um, contact sport. Mm-hmm. But as far as basketball, it you no know, guys know, like you know, GMs know, like you, you know, you see the special guys that are elite and can play in the league. What is one year in college gonna do? <laughs> is, is it gonna make a huge and and, and to be a, uh, you know to be hundred percent you know transparent. When those one and done guys go to college, they're not going to college like year round. It, it literally, they they come in the summer to get their bodies right. They enroll. They're in school starting in the August September ish, and they're out of school as soon as mm-hmm. March gets because the term's over and they're preparing for the upcoming draft. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't really make sense because they're they're really only doing one semester. Of college, yeah, yeah. you have to drop the second semester because you leave in March, March, April, and part of May. You're missing all the classes. Mm-hmm. So to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, for whatever reason, I guess the NCAA wants to make money off of these student athletes more, and so I think they were working in cahoots with the NBA to be like, yeah. hey, this this, this um, age um, limit on there. Um, but I think the NBA is moving around where, you know, they're allowing these guys out of high school to go to the G League and, and use it as a, a minor league development um, and getting them ready um, for that next jump. Yeah. So you're in the NBA now. What's that? What's that? I'm in the NBA moment. Like, oh, man, this is different. Like, what was it? Was it going against someone in practice? You know, what was that moment? Well, to me, it was like game one, you know. Practice was cool. You know, Coach Sloan, it was tough. So, but I've been coached tough my whole entire life. My dad was my coach. I coached, you know, played for a great coach at, at Fayetteville High School, great, uh, Garrett, Barry Gebhardt, great coach at Woodland Junior High, uh, Kyle Adams, Coach Stamps was my assistant, Coach Oskowski was an assistant. Go to college, played under Stan Heath and Ronnie Telefero, Ronnie Thompson, Coach Sorrenton, Coach Flask. All these guys are tough coaches. So, like, being coached tough by Coach Sloan, wasn't anything new, you know, AU basketball probably got cussed out a million times, by, you know, Don Williams. And, you know, he was able to be hard on me because he saw my dad being hard on me. So being coach hard was not a, a huge adjustment. Um, it kind of was like our first game was like a, Oh shoot moment when, you know, we're playing at home versus the Houston Rockets. Yeah. I mean, comes out there and I'm like, dudes, like <laughs> right side of his body's, bigger than my whole body, just the right, like right shoulder, you know, legs is way bigger than me. And then I remember them, like my teammates, Ronnie, Ronnie, bro, bro, you got T-Mac. And I'm like, T-Mac? <laughs> I, I had every pair of T-Macs growing up. Like, like that's, the, that's the shoes that we wore in college. Like, I got, I'm i guarding T-Mac. I was like, nah, I got, I got, I got Shane Batty. I got Shane Batty. No, 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 you got T-Mac. I'm you got like, T-Mac. <laughs> Prime T Mac too, like my first my first NBA game, I'm guarding Prime T Mac, and I remember I remember shaking and being nervous, and you know Darren Williams being like, "Hey man, he, he, he puts on his shoes just like you put on your shoes." I was like, well, "No, he's got T Mac's on, and you know I just got regular Nikes on." And uh, <laughs> I remember just playing as hard as I possibly can, and you know I think I had like seven points. I had a, my first career point was like a, I played the pass lane, got a steal, went down, and got a dunk, and Okay. Right then and there, I was like, okay, I think I've arrived a little bit. I can put the ball in the basket. I can, you know, I can make plays on defense. I can, I can find my niche here. You know, it's not like I'm gonna be riding the bench. And so, mm-hmm. uh, from that point on, it's like, you know, it was kind of like a video game. You know, you would see nights where you know Kobe would have sixty points, or Vince Carter, or uh, Michael Red, or Dwayne Wade, or and then Kevin Durant came in the league, and LeBron, and and. Um, 
Ray Allen and Rashard Lewis and Steven Jackson and, Lewis and Gerald awesome. Wallace, Paul Pierce, uh, Joe Johnson. You know, the list goes on. Gilbert Arenas, you, you, the guys that I would have to guard you know, during my time. Um, it was just crazy. It, it was like a who's who's who um, night in, night out. And I mean, you would see guys who put up video game numbers. And I was like, man, that's just crazy that these guys are doing this. And uh, it's very, it's a very humbling moment because, you know, I would always tell my friends back home, they called me because, you know, obviously everybody's Lakers fans or Celtics fans or Bulls or mm -hmm. Heat or whatever, wherever you grew up, um, fans of those people. So for, all my friends are huge Kobe fans, rest in peace. Um, they would hit me, oh, man, you got Kobe, you got Kobe, you, you got Kobe, you nervous, you scared. I'm like, nah, man, I, I mean, all I can do is play as hard as I probably can. And I was like, man, I did my job if I kept him under his average one and I kept him. For and he was averaging like 35. That was like Kobe yeah. was going off. That was was average, yeah. He was like and, cooking. And I would always tell people if he, if he scored 30, hey, man, he's supposed to do that. And I would always <laughs> be like, well, at least he didn't score 82. <laughs> that, was, that was my go-to saying is, hey, man, I, I, I didn't allow him to, to, to break his scoring record and, you know, Held him under 81 points, but uh, <laughs> finally, you know, everybody misses him and what he meant to yeah. the game of basketball. Yeah, we all miss him. Mo? Yeah, so you saying all those names and then you saying, like, you were the guy on your teams um, to guard those players. Mm -hmm. You were known for your defense. Yeah. So, like, when did you know that being a lockdown defender was going to be, like, I guess you could say your calling, your, your yeah. specialty, because like you said, you were guarding the best scores in the league, some of the best scores in history, yes. but you were the guy oh, that in had their prime. To, yeah, oh, like in, in their, their prime. prime. Your first well, game was against T-Mac. You had to guard Kobe, but you were known <laughs> to be a lockdown defender. So yeah. when in your head did you say, this is going to be my specialty? Because a lot of players, like you look at the NBA now, guys don't really – we have our lockdown defenders, but they just – Defense isn't the thing, but it became your thing. And people don't love defense. Defense isn't yeah. sexy. It's Man, scoring the points, scoring 30. So when did you decide that I'm going to make this my thing and I'm going to be the great, you know, one of the best defenders, one of the better defenders, if not the best defender in the league? It's crazy um, how how full circle it goes. You know, in high school, I averaged 30 points a game. Um, <laughs> in college, I averaged 19 points a game. So my mindset going into the NBA is I'm going to be a big-time scorer. Um, I get to Utah, and Coach Sloan and Ty Corbin basically are uh, having a, a conversation with me, and they literally have the roster, and it was like, what do you see on this roster? And um, I'm going down the names. You know, it's basically their first and last name, their college, how many years they've been pro, and what they made and what their salary was. So I'm going down, I'm going down, and, and I really didn't know what he was trying to – what point he was trying to make. So I'm kind of sweating like, man, I, I don't know what he wants me to say. And I was like, well, these – everybody's from all different places. No, Ronnie, that's not what I'm looking for. That's not the answer I'm looking for. Um, you know, I'm one of three rookies. No, Ronnie, that's not the answer I'm looking for. I'm like, man, I, I, they make more money than I do. Some of the vet veterans make more money. And they're like, no, that's not the answer I'm looking for. He says, if you look at our roster, Carlos Boozer averaging a double double, Score. points and rebounds, all star. Mimido Kerr averaging, you know, a lot of points, almost double double rebounds. Good player. All star. Andre Kirilenko, a utility guy, almost doing everything. You know, max, max, max no. contract, um, scoring, rebounding, assisting, blocking shots, steals. He, he did it all. Darren Williams, top pick, double double guy, one of the best PGs in the league. You guys had a squad. <laughs> yeah, was loaded. You don't realize how good your team was. You're you're going down the list of guys, Matt Harper, and I'm like, okay, coach, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, I'm missing the, the drift. Ty Corbin was like, all those names you 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 called, none of them those guys are a lockdown defender. As a matter of fact, majority of those guys' defense is below average or just average. He's like, you know, D Will locked up, but Andre Karolinko played defense differently. But those other guys didn't guard at a high level. He mm -hmm. was like, Ronnie, if you want to play as a rookie, do something that, that 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 these guys don't do. Be a unicorn. Be different. Be an asset um, to a team where they can say, hey, we can't do this without him. And 
that resonated with me and I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, there's there's a ton of guys in this league that get paid millions of dollars to put the ball in the basket. If mm-hmm. I can stop these guys that are getting paid millions of dollars to put the ball in the basket, somebody pay me millions of dollars from stopping them from putting the ball in the basket. And I can stay on the court. And I can be on the court early as a rookie. And so that's what I did. And it just stuck with me because you know, I took pride in my defense. I, I took pride in not getting scored on. Um, and it also was like, you know, it, it felt good to be a two-way player. You know, be able to, you know, some of my days in Utah, you know, I, one year almost averaged 14 points a game and another time 13. And uh, the other uh, year, double-figure scoring. And my rookie year, not as much because I didn't play that much. But, you know, even in Chicago, coming off the bench, being a, a consistent contributor offensively. Um, but, you know, known for my defense because, you know, uh, I, I had the – the, I guess the um, ability to be able to guard majority of the, the best players on the op- uh, opposing team. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of Chicago, um, you play for the Bulls. Derrick Rose is there. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you were there for his MB- MVP season, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. So now you know a lot of guys forget. They 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 forget how good Derrick Rose was, and they forget how good y'all's Bulls team were. Mm-hmm. Y'all was battling it out with the Miami Heat at that time. Yeah. Tell me about like being a part of that team. Uh, you know that you got the MVP on your team, and y'all were battling it out with the Heat. It was like a rivalry at that point. What was that point in time in your career like where you know you're gonna be the guy going in there guarding LeBron, and you got the MVP and Derrick Rose. What, what was that point in your career like? And what was it like playing with a guy as good as Derrick Rose? I mean, you played with Darren Williams. You played with great guys. But Derrick yeah. Rose, at that point in time, people tend to forget how good he was. So what was that time with that Bulls team like? Well, I, I, always, I always say this. And and because I, I think Derrick always gets a, the short end of the stick. There hasn't been many years that Derrick Rose hasn't really contributed in the NBA. Like, mm-hmm. dude's been a consistent 16, 17, 18 points per game, six or seven assists guy his whole entire career. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So now when people are like, oh, you know, injuries and what could have been, like Derrick Rose is still a problem. He's still like a dude in the NBA. Like he's mm-hmm. not like a, a, a guy that shouldn't be in the league and, you know, mm-hmm. on the end of his uh, his career. He's still a dude. But the years that we had in Chicago was special, it was phenomenal. Um, and it was special for me. And I think our team, because we saw and we knew how much it meant to Derrick Rose to bring success in a championship back to the city of Chicago. Being from Chicago, I, I, I can't relate to it because, you know, I don't have an a NBA team in my home city. Mm-hmm. Uh, Derrick Rose basically got drafted by his home city and put that franchise on his back mm-hmm. and basically turned it to where it was to the number one team in the NBA. I mean, we, we were number one two years in a row in the East, uh, and you know, first our first year came up just very short against a a, a well coached veteran Miami Heat team. You know, you had LeBron, D Wade, and Bosh, arguably three of the top ten guys in the league on the same yeah. team. You know what I'm saying? So for us to have beat them four times in the regular season, and then you know come up short in the playoffs, you know. That second year, you know, D Rose won the MVP his first year. That second year, we it was a no-brainer. Hey, this is going to be our year, and we're going to win the championship. You know, we are a little bit more experienced now. Uh, everything's not new for us. You know, going to the, the, the conference championship wasn't new for us. Um, we had been there, done that. We had to take that next step, and you know, unfortunately, D Rose tore his ACL and kind of took the win out of our sails. But you know, playing with him and and seeing the passion he played. For the city of Chicago, you know, it was, it's, it was second to none. It was it was something great and something phenomenal to experience. And I, I'll, I'll keep that memory for the rest of my life. I remember Joe Kim Noah talking about um, talking about that season, like going into that season, saying we're going to win it all, and yeah. just you know when D Rose gets hurt, and it's just like how deflating it was, and how just like like we were going to this was going to be our season, like. Uh, it's it's and you just see the pain in his like talking about Derek and that's how much like and I remember watching that game and just like the just I'm sure like all the momentum like 
all the momentum, like just it deflate. You're deflated, and it's like not only like the championship hopes may be done, but Derrick Rose is like he's on the ground. He's done. Like, just talk to me about that. That that yeah. that when it happened and just like the arena. I'm sure it was just like a dead silence when he's on yeah. the ground. Yeah. Um. You know, we put so much into. Obviously, it's a team game. Obviously. It, it was a lot of individuals coming together to, to with the same common goal. But we worked so hard to do it for D. Rose. Yeah, we wanted the success for us, but we, we wanted more for D. Rose to be able to, to win a championship for his city. And we knew how his preparation, what, it, what, it, what he was doing, you know, coming in early, getting up shots. You know, a lot of people, if y'all don't remember, a lot of people were saying that, like, we'll go under screen. Derrick Rose can't really shoot the basketball. He's athletic. He can get to the basketball, but he can't really shoot. He hated to hear that. He was in the mm-hmm. gym hours shooting mid-range jump shots, working on his three-point shot, working on his free throws, working on his floater, just so he could take out flaws in his game. And we saw that. And he was like, man, who are we not to work just as hard? Um, and so, you know, when he went down and got hurt, man, it was it was really sad. And, you know, I, know, I mean, I felt bad for, like, C.J. Watson, um, you know, uh, the backup point guard because so much pressure put on him and John Lucas to 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 carry the team and, and not miss a beat. You know, him and Mike James, they did the best they possibly could. And um, you know, you just can't, you know, duplicate D Rose and, and his contributions that he had on our team. He's still hoping, you know, Absolutely. playing with the Knicks. Yeah, he's still hoping and, and seeing that mentorship, it seems like he's he's definitely you know, taking on that role of being the leader of the team. You see him now with the younger guys, IQ, top it, you know, talking to the young guys, getting them up. He's definitely showing, you know, it, that uh, he, he still could play and, you know, embracing that mentorship. And at the end of the day, that is still MVP Derrick Rose. You know, he still will always be called MVP, you know, no matter what. So a few more things before we let you go, Ronnie. We appreciate your time that you, you've you given us so far. I'm a Can Knicks I- fan. Hold on a second. I got it. my charger. I have to grab my charger. No doubt, no doubt. About the thing. Sorry. <laughs> Let me go grab it real quick. I'm sorry. Got you, no, got you. Good. All right. good. No I'm worries. <laughs> I'm going to talk to him about, you know, his time in New York and then we could close it out. But, yeah, this is this has been good. This has been fun conversation with Ronnie Brewer. Chopping it up. Um, this this has been dope. This, is, this has been a lot of fun so far. Um yeah, man, Derrick Rose, man. That, I mean, he was there, too. Like, to see that, I mean, you hear – I heard Joe Kim Noah talking about it, and you hear everyone like, yo, we were going to win that year. Like, they were like, yeah. we were going to come and we were going to beat Miami that year. And they had everything. They had they all had, the – They had a different – the thing about that Chicago team, I remember, because, you know, I'm a Heat fan. Yeah. That mentality. They Sorry about that. had that mentality. All good, all good. Yeah, yeah. They that definitely, was what was different about that Bulls team that year was – that that doll they had some dogs. Tibbs. Like yeah. Tibbs, man. Dogs. Like yeah. and that was why I, I mean when they say it, I, I believe it. Like it, no no offense, right? I'm a Heat fan. Yeah. So you know what I'm saying? But I hear how how passionate y'all are about the fact like we were gonna win the championship. I believe it. Like Joe Kim, dog. No matter what mm-hmm. anybody say about Noah, he was gonna go out there, he was a dog. You were a dog on defense. Like you you knew your abilities on defense. Derrick Rose, we knew what Derrick Rose was like. That team just, and like you said, the Tibbs Colts team. You look at him with the Knicks now. It's just, dog, it's a dog mentality. He was good with Jimmy Butler. That was a perfect star to play with him. I know they kind of fell out or whatever with the situation and playing with young guys, but like it was just that dog mentality. So, so I believe that y'all really feel like, and, and even probably to this day, feel like you know if Rose didn't go down, we win the championship. Cause it, yeah. I just hear it, you know, Joe and Kim talk about. It, I hear you talk about, it, and it's like in your mind, like you know, we were winning. It, there was no, you know, what I'm saying. So I know that's something. I feel like is that like a regret? Like that's not a regret, is it? It's just something yeah, to think no, about. No, it's not a. It's not a regret because, I mean, you gotta, you know, show respect to to the teams that you lost to. You know, the the Heat was a phenomenal team. Mm-hmm. You had, you know, three of the top ten guys in, in the league. You know, he had phenomenal role players around him. Ray, Ray Allen, Mike Miller, and uh, Chalmers, and Udonis Haslam, and you have guys that come in and, and contribute at a high level, 
know, it's, it take, it's hard to beat them, especially when you were beating them in the regular season. So, mm-hmm. you know, our mentality was like, you know, we all knew our, our backgrounds and, you know, we all were like, man, we came from the mud and we gon' we're dogs and we're not going to allow them to outwork us. And, you know, a couple of plays here and there didn't go our way and went their way and, you know, that the better team won. So it's not a regret because you have to show respect to the team that to your opponent. But we, we, we were very confident in our team and we knew the work that we put in and you know, Coach Tibbs was a great leader for us because he had a plan at a high level. Yeah. And I wanted to talk to you about your time with the Knicks. I'm a Knicks fan. Uh, okay. you, you signed with them the year they had the last great season, right? 2012, 2013, when they won 50. Now you didn't set, spend the whole season there, but just talk to me about your time in New York. Yeah. The Cause it seemed like that was the year they, they everything, seemed like it was it was coming back new york city you know the yeah. garden was going to be rocking again and it was for that year but just talk to me about that environment you know when you, when Dude, you first that, that, that was that was one of the better situations i've played in you know usually when you go to new york you know you know the knicks haven't hadn't been good and the knicks fans are showing usually the opponents love <laughs> coming to town. you know we were coming into town with the bulls you know they were showing us love you know we're throwing i'm throwing alley to d rose and the one no look passes to Joe Keem and Taj Gibson. Those both guys are from New York. So we always wanted to play well when we went to New York. Uh, when I was at Utah, wanted to come there and play well. D, uh, D. Will wanted to put on a show. Bulls wanted to get a double double. We wanted to always come out with a win. Fast forward to me signing with them. And, you know, it's one of the oldest teams in NBA history. You, had, you know, Jay Kidd and Marcus Camby and Kirk Kenny Thomas, Martin too, right? Jason, yeah, yeah. Rasheed, Rasheed, Rasheed Wallace, um, you know, myself, Melo, and Amari Stoudemire, were, and James Flight White and Chris Copeland were considered James the young White. dudes. Uh, <laughs> you know, Pablo Prigioni was one of the oldest rookies in NBA history. Uh, Raymond Felton was one of the veteran guys on there. Uh, you know, J.R. Smith was a vet on the team. Iman Shumper was the young guy, considered the young guy. Steve Novak was a vet for us. Um, so we had, a, we, had a, we, had a, we had a great nucleus. Um, you know, Melo was one of the best teammates because, you know, I, I feel like he, t- he he's such a phenomenal player. And in New York, he wanted to win so bad for the, for the state and win it in the garden that, you know, he had games where, you know, we didn't shoot the ball well. You know, that year, you know, I was, I was asked to be more of a corner three-point shooter, Lockdown defender and kind of a glue guy to a, a veteran team, which you know, I try to do my best to my ability. Um, but Melo was out there scoring 30 points a night, defending night mm-hmm. in, night out, what people weren't giving him credit for. Uh, and we'd lose a game, and people they boo us and be like, Melo, you know, in the in the news, Melo got to do more. And it's like, Melo would come out to the to you know, to the press, man, it's my fault, I got to do more, I got to put this team on my back. It's like, dude, you're like. NBA Player of the Week, averaging the high twenties, <laughs> best start in Knicks like in in a long time for the Knicks. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know the the fans really got behind us when we were playing well. We were playing together, playing playing um, great style basketball, and it was it was just fun to be a part of. Yeah, I mean the Garden is. I mean it's no nothing like it. You know, it's nothing like it. Uh, the Garden and all that. So. Ronnie, this this was a fun conversation. Before we let you go, I want to ask you one thing, um, yeah. and I've been doing this lately, and, and asking people, what, what are you most grateful for? I mean, you had a you had a you know an, an eight year NBA career. I mean, they talk about you know longevity and all that. Guys playing what two three years, you know, that's kind of like the average. You got to play eight years. You got to play in Utah. You got to play in New York City for a little bit. Chicago experience all these different you know guard some of the top players. Get to do your thing. What are you most grateful for, for um, you know regarding your career and just life? Man, I, I, I'm most grateful for the relationships and the connections that this beautiful game has, has brought to me. You know, it's allowed me to come on y'all's show. It's allowed me to travel all over the world. It allowed me to, to live in these great cities and not just play basketball in these cities, but put my fingerprint in these individual cities as far as helping in the community with either my foundation or um, each team's individual communities, uh, community outreach. And it's something that's, that, that rubbed off on me to continue to, to do in my community. And um, my mom always told me this, that 
you don't really know where you're going in life until you know where you're from. And you got to know where you're from to know where you're going in life. And, you know, that's something that sticks with me and I'm forever grateful for it. Um, you know, I'm grateful for my family. Uh, I'm grateful for this, this great game of basketball and what it's all provided me and my family. Um, and it's allowed me to give back um, to, to the youth. Um, and, and that's something I'm forever grateful for. Yeah. Mo, you got anything for Ronnie? No, man, I just I appreciate your time and uh, giving us the opportunity to really hold a really great conversation. You know, um, really, really, this is my first time talking to a former NBA athlete. So it was definitely dope to really hear like stories from inside the NBA. You have guys covering the NBA and, and stuff, but to really get that lock guy who's been in the locker room, played with these great players was known for his defense, you know, and just the come up. Cause that, and, and you brought it up without having to be asked was the grind. Cause that was what, that was my biggest question that I had planned was like, just tell us about, like, we know you were in the NBA, you know you were in the NBA, but yeah. tell us what, the, what it took to get there with knowing the mentality of you played in the SEC, then you played D1. So you and every other player on your team was the best in their state, their city, their area. So, you know, that you hit it on the head just made it so much easier. But I definitely appreciate your time. Like, it, it was definitely something that I'm a cherish. So I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate both of y'all. I appreciate y'all allowing me to be on y'all's y'all show, uh, allow me to be on this platform. And, um, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. No, no, thank you. Like I said, we really appreciate you coming on the show, Ronnie. This was a lot of fun. You know, uh, thank you for taking the time out to, to top it up with us for this last hour and, and talk about your, you know, your grind and, and, and the journey. To me, that's so important. You know, lo I love do tell, telling stories and, and, you know, going through the timeline of how everything comes about. Because to me, that's, that's just so dope. But I really appreciate your time. One more thing. If I'm going to go to Arkansas, what's the place to go to eat? Uh, depends on what you're trying to eat. I mean, if you're I mean, trying to be a barbecue, like, if I'm speaking, barbecue. If, I'm a barbecue guy. So if I'm if, going out, what's the barbecue spot? If, if, if you're in Fayetteville, you're trying to get some barbecue. I rec recommend you go to Wright's Barbecue. Uh, they got one in Johnson, Arkansas, and Benville, Arkansas. It's some of the best barbecue you can probably get. Uh, they've got phenomenal brisket, chicken, ribs, uh, jalapeno sausages. Oh. The sides oh. are great. Um, <laughs> you, know, you can't go wrong with it. They, they cater a lot of our, our stuff for the high school and. You know, some, you know the, the family there is great, and so you know if you were to come in here and be like, "I need a good meal," it's either Wrights or I'm, I'm gonna send you to, to Herman's Steakhouse, and you you can get or it's Herman's Rib House. You can get ribs, but steak, chicken, uh, burgers, and stuff like that. So those are, those two places is where I could hang my hat on, and, and I can sleep well at night, being like, "Hey." I got those guys a good meal. <laughs> I know we, we got one of our other co-workers, uh, Stephen, and you, you were just on his show recently, and he's from yeah. Arkansas, so, you know, uh, I'm going to pick his brain and see, uh, you know, you know what. Uh, if I ever get to Arkansas, that, that's going to be the spot, so uh, I'll tell him <laughs> Ronnie sent me. And, Absolutely. And, uh, but, uh, Ron, do you have anything you want to, you know, promote or anything? Do you have anything, you know, projects or, you know, anything Man, going uh, on the foundation you talked about? Just, just follow me on social media, just Ronnie Brewer Jr., uh, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. That basically, those social media outlets, I, you know, I, I'm posting stuff about our high school basketball team. I post stuff about the Arkansas Razorbacks, NBA stuff, um, uh, and the Woods Elite team for this summer that I coach. Mm -hmm. I put a lot of stuff about, you know, I do a radio show on Wednesdays on ESPN 99.5, um, you know, stuff about the foundation stuff about some of my businesses that i have out here uh so if that's if you want to keep up with me or see what i'm doing you know hit the like button or there, the follow. Go. there we go everybody thank you for listening that's ronnie brewer thanks everyone for tuning in um the podcast will come out later but like i said ronnie appreciate your time mo thanks for joining me on this special episode that and like i said once again thanks for everyone for listening tuning in uh and that's it well, I'm Chris LeBron from the Off the Ball podcast. That's Mo from Up in Flames, part of the Off the Ball network. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Make sure to follow us on social media, Up in Flames, Mo Up in Flames. Follow me on Off the Ball Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Make sure to go to OffTheBallNetwork.com for all your sports needs. Make sure to, to follow OTB, uh, Off the Ball Network on social media, OTB underscore on Twitter, all that good stuff. Like I said, shows going to be coming out this week. Once again, Ronnie. Thanks for your time. Be safe. Be well. God bless. All right. Take care, guys. Thank you, man. You have a good night.